Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on calculus of variations. In this video I'm going to derive the equation of a catenary using the principles we've discussed in calculus of variations so far. But some of you may not know what a catenary is, so let me describe the problem we're going to solve first. Suppose that I had a string of length L and I hung the ends of that string from x equals negative a to x equals a in the presence of gravity. Suppose also that L is greater than 2a, which means that instead of being flat and horizontal, the string will actually sag downwards when there's gravity present. The shape of this hanging string can be described using a function y of x, and this shape that the string takes on when hanging under gravity is called a catenary. Now let's begin solving our problem to determine the equation of this catenary. Just a few things to note before I start going crazy with calculations. Number one is that we'll assume that this string is uniform with a constant mass per unit length of mu. Number two is that we'll assume the ends of the string hang at the same horizontal level of y equals zero. And finally, number three is that we'll assume the direction of positive y is upwards. The goal of this problem is to determine the equation of this catenary given these physical parameters. But what equations do we set up and how do we even get started? Well, one fact that's pretty obvious is that the length of the string is a fixed value. And if you recall from Calculus 1 and from my previous videos, we can calculate the length of the string by integrating the element of arc length ds over the entire string. And this integral I'm going to call j. But we know that this arc length integral can also be written in terms of x and y, as the integral from negative a to a of the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared dx. We also know that this integral is actually equal to a fixed constant L, which is the length of the string. So this is actually the integral representing our constraint. But what about the integral representing the actual functional that we want to optimize? Because as it turns out, this is going to be a calculus of variations problem. Well, let's go back to the principles of basic physics. Suppose I had a ball, and suppose I let go of that ball from high above the floor. Where do you think the ball is going to go? Well, it's obviously going to drop to the ground because going to the ground means a region of lower potential energy. And in the absence of external forces, the ball would quote unquote prefer to move to a region of lower potential energy. Now what about a chemical reaction? Well, a chemical reaction would prefer to move to the side with more stable molecules since stable molecules have a lower potential energy. So in the absence of external forces, physical systems prefer to move to a configuration where they have a lower potential energy. We can use this principle when it comes to formulating equations for our catenary. We could say that the shape of our catenary is such that the total gravitational potential energy, ug, of the string is minimized. But how do we compute ug? Well, let's zoom in and take an infinitesimally small segment of the string of length ds. The gravitational potential energy of this very small segment is the mass, which is mu ds, times the gravitational acceleration g, times the height of that mass relative to the ground, which is just y. So if we want the total gravitational potential energy of this string, we have to add a whole bunch of these dugs. And how do we do that? Well, we integrate over the entire string. Again, we can rewrite the infinitesimal arc length ds in terms of x and y as before. And when we do that, here's what we'll get for the total gravitational potential energy of the string. Now, this gravitational potential energy depends on the function y describing the shape of the string. So we can say that ug is a functional which depends on y of x. And because the string wants to minimize its potential energy, my whole goal with this problem should be to minimize ug given the constraint that the length of the string must equal a fixed constant L. So this problem is basically a constrained variation problem. And if you remember from the previous video, the way to solve a constrained variation problem is to construct a new functional k that equals the functional you're trying to optimize, which is ug plus a Lagrange multiplier lambda times the constraint functional j. If we plug in the integral expressions for u, g, and j, here's the integral we're going to get for capital K. 
The next step now is to take this constructed functional capital K and directly apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to it. If I denote the expression inside the integral as capital F of x, y, and y prime, then the Euler-Lagrange equation tells me that the partial of f with respect to y minus the derivative with respect to x of partial f partial y prime is zero. But we're not directly going to use the Euler-Lagrange equation here. Can you think of why? Well, it's because f doesn't explicitly depend on x, and if capital F doesn't explicitly depend on x, we can use a simplified variant of the Euler-Lagrange equation to solve for the stationary function y called the Beltrami identity, according to which capital F minus y prime times partial capital F partial y prime is a constant c1. Now capital F actually contains the square root of 1 plus y prime squared twice. So let's first find the partial derivative of that with respect to y prime and plug everything in from there. And if we evaluate this derivative, we'll get 1 divided by 2 times the square root of 1 plus y prime squared times the partial with respect to y prime of 1 plus y prime squared according to the chain rule. And if we simplify this, we'll get y prime over the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. Let's go ahead and plug this derivative into the Beltrami identity. Once we do that, we can multiply this y prime inside and here's what we'll get. Now we can actually simplify the left hand side even more. We'll get the least common denominator and then we'll be in a pretty good position to simplify the expression. We can now cancel out this term and this term and we can cancel out these two terms as well. And when we do that, we'll get the following expression. Now we're going to square both sides and then we're going to simplify by isolating y prime or dy by dx. We'll move the denominator to the other side, then we'll multiply out the c1 squared and then we'll solve for dy by dx. So y prime or dy by dx is the square root of mu gy plus lambda squared over c1 squared minus 1. The best way to solve this differential equation for our unknown function y is to separate variables. So we'll move all the terms involving y to the left and all the terms involving x to the right. So let's do that. Move the y terms to the left and the x terms to the right. And once we've separated the variables, we can integrate both sides. On the right hand side, we know that the integral of dx is just x plus c2, where c2 is another integration constant. But the left hand side is significantly more tedious to integrate if you don't know how to conveniently pull substitutions out of thin air, or if you don't have an integration table readily available. Luckily I can do you a favor and pull a very convenient substitution out of thin air where I'll replace mu gy plus lambda over c1 by cosine u. In that case, we'll have the following integral. Now all that's left is to replace dy by something involving du and complete our u substitution. So we'll take this equation for u and we'll differentiate it. And when we do that, we'll find that dy is c1 cinch u over mu g times du. Now if we substitute this dy into the integral, we'll get the following. And we know from hyperbolic trig identities that the square root term becomes the hyperbolic sign of u. Both of these hyperbolic signs will then cancel, so we'll just end up having to integrate c1 over mu g with respect to u. And this is pretty simple. We'll have c1 over mu g times u, which equals x plus c2. Now, we know from up here that cosine u equals mu g y plus lambda over c1. That means if we isolate for u, we'll have u equals the inverse hyperbolic cosine of mu g y plus lambda over c1. Let's now plug that inverse hyperbolic cosine for u into our expression. And once we do that, we'll divide by the constant on the left, and then we'll take the hyperbolic cosine of both sides. Now all that's left to do is isolate for y. And when we do that, here's what we'll get. And this is the equation for our catenary. But there's three unknown constants in this expression. We've got c1 as an unknown, c2 as an unknown, and lambda as an unknown. And because we've got three unknowns, we need three equations to determine these three unknowns. 
two of those equations we can get from the boundary conditions. That's because if we go way back up to where we originally drew our catenary, we know that y must be zero at the boundaries of x equals negative a and x equals a. So at x equals negative a, y equals zero, which means this is the equation for our first boundary condition. And at x equals positive a, y is also zero, so this is the equation for our second boundary condition. We can then rewrite both of these equations by moving the lambda term to the other side. So I'm just going to erase this equal to zero and put the equal in place of the subtraction in the equation. Now here's where we'll use another hyperbolic trig identity. That the hyperbolic cosine of something is the same as the hyperbolic cosine of negative something, which resembles the corresponding trigonometric identity for cosine. Both of our boundary conditions kind of resemble this identity. Both the cosines are equal to the same thing. One of them has a negative a and the other has a positive a. However, there's this little c2 that's getting in the way. But since both of these cosines are equal to each other, we can safely say that c2 must be zero. Because if c2 is zero, we're actually just following this identity. That cosine of something equals cosine of negative something. And since c2 is zero, we can write our boundary condition equations as follows. Both of these cosines are equal, so it doesn't matter what we go with when we're determining the expression for lambda. I'm just going to pick the one with the positive a because I'm an optimistic person. So that means lambda is going to be c1 times cosine of mu g a over c1. Now, if we plug this back into our equation for y, here's what we'll get. All that's left is to find c1, but we need another equation for that and we've run out of our boundary conditions. Can you think of what equation will help us solve for c1? It's the constraint equation. We already know what y is, so we can easily determine the derivative dy by dx, which is the hyperbolic sine of mu gx over c1. Let's plug this into the constraint equation. Again. We can use hyperbolic trig identities to simplify this into the integral of cosine mu gx over c1. And if we integrate this hyperbolic cosine, we'll get hyperbolic sine. And once we integrate it, we can then apply the limits, in which case we'll get the hyperbolic sine of mu ga over c1 minus the hyperbolic sine of negative mu ga over c1. Now using the properties of hyperbolic sine according to which the hyperbolic sine of negative something equals the negative hyperbolic sine of something, we can take out this negative sign and turn this minus into a plus. And when we do that, our equation for c1 will become 2c1 over mu g times the hyperbolic sine of mu g a over c1 equals l. So finally, the equation for our catenary is y equals c1 over mu g times the hyperbolic cosine of mu g x over c1 minus the hyperbolic cosine of mu g a over c1, where c1 can be found by solving this nonlinear equation in terms of l. It's very difficult to solve this equation analytically, but you can solve it numerically if you want to, if you'd like to substitute some numbers into the equation. And this is how to solve a problem involving constrained variation and Lagrange multipliers. Anyway, that does it for this video. I'll finish off by thanking the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description so you can check it out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.